Good morning. It's a still morning, right? <laughs> there is a time gap between Texas and uh, LA, so I have to make sure that it is still morning. Thanks for the wonderful music uh, that I really enjoyed. Uh, music is such a powerful language beyond language of inspiration. So I truly enjoyed being here. What is Sunday for you? Why are you here on this bright Sunday morning when you could have been doing something fun, relaxing, and or entertaining? Sunday is, in a way, a rebellion against every day. Sunday is not and should not be a mere continuation of other weekdays. If Sunday is a mere continuation and repetition of weekdays, thinking about the same stuff that we usually do during weekdays, what's the point of coming to church on Sunday? To observe Sunday in a meaningful way, we should make an intentional, decisive discontinuity from weekdays, an intentional detachment from our daily lives, so that we can ask root questions that we do not usually ask in our mundane lives and encounter a new world, a new birth of our new being. That's why God commands Moses, take your shoes off. In this sense, Sunday should be an event of a new birth, which would mean we could experience a critical before and after the Sunday. You withdraw yourself from the everydays in order to encounter the root questions such as, who am I? Why I am doing what I am doing? What is it that would make my life, the only life, meaningful? Or as St. Augustine wrestles, and asks, what do I love when I love my God? Many Christians often say that Jesus is the answer. But in order to make Jesus as the one who offers answers, we must know what our questions are. Only when we ask the questions, only when we have a courage and intentionality to encounter these root questions, we would be then able to find answers. But when you do not have questions, you would never, never get the answers. In this sense, questions are more, more profound than answers. So don't rush to find quick, ready-made answers for your own life. To be is to inherit that the being of what we are is first of all inheritance. Whether we like it or know it or not, inheritance is not about receiving something and having it uh, in our possession to use as we see fit. In this sense, inheritance is never a given but it comes as a task. We have inherited the world, civilization, society, traditions, religion, and, and church, and so forth. And you have inherited 150 years of tradition of this first congregational church. If the inheritance is not just a given, but a task, what tasks we, do we have to carry out? What kind of responsibility we have to the inheritance of a Christian church? The inheritance of tradition comes as an injunction to which we must respond. Inheriting the tradition of a church should not mean a blind uh, acceptance of inheritance. 
inheriting the tradition of church does not mean to be a blind defender or transmitter of Christian tradition. For the tradition of Christian church has often carried dark side, implicitly or explicitly, bounded by religious or cultural superiorism, ethnocentrism, homophobism, exclusive nationalism, sexism, racism, ableism, and so forth. So if this dark side is part of the tradition of a church in, we inherit, what kind of responsibility we should take as an heir of the tradition of a church? This is why inheriting the tradition of a church is not just a given, but a task. The task involves a double responsibility. First, a contestation, and second, an affirmation. We must contest what is deadly, discriminative, exclusive in the inheritance of the tradition. At the same time, we must affirm and reaffirm what in it gives life which also requires innovating new tradition as well. In order to take up the double responsibility to the traditions of this, uh, uh, the church, it is necessary for us to read and study the tradition in question. The two biblical texts we read today offers us a significant insight as to what it means by being Jesus' disciples, what it means by being church, and what religion should be about. Jesus' message in John 13 is like a Jesus' farewell address. Jesus introduces a new commandment to his disciples in his farewell address. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Here, loving is not self-evident. It is such a complex question that we have to wrestle with. Jesus' farewell address contains an extremely significant theological insight for the question of what it means to be Jesus' disciples. Many Christians have regarded being Jesus' disciples as identical with having membership in a Christian church. However, Jesus' farewell address affirms the essential nature of being Jesus' disciples, which is practicing love, exercising an unconditional hospitality, showing compassion to the other, to the strangers, to the foreigners, to the guests. Jesus presents the core of his teaching in the following statement in Matthew 25. The truth is, every time you did this for the least of my sisters and brothers, you did it for me. The name Jesus here symbolizes substitution, which entails a being with and for the other. Nowadays, for a large number of Christians, church is becoming like a salvation club. In this salvation club mentality, Christians usually think that as long as they maintain their membership of a church, the salvation is guaranteed. For this kind of Christians, being a Christian is like uh, you have a salvation insurance just in case. Churches become the places where people exercise a kind of spiritual capitalism in which an economy of exchange operates and maximizing the self-interest rather than the common good is the only prime virtue and goal of their religious life. However, according to these two biblical texts, 
following Jesus, being disciples of Jesus, is far from being the member of the private salvation club. This morning, I would like to use a new term that I coined, that I use for my teaching, Jesusian, rather than Christian. The term Christian has a strong link to Christianity as an institutionalized religion, whereas Jesusian is to acknowledge the discrepancy between the church and Jesus. The church as an institutionalized religion has all different kinds of problems. So Jesusian is to emphasize and focus on the very life and teachings of Jesus. So we are not just uh, uh, Christians, but also we should be a Jesusian. What Jesus teaches from these texts are about religion in general and church in particular. According to Jesus, religion, being Jesus' disciples and Jesusian church should be about love, responsibility, hospitality to the others in our individual and collective lives. In this sense, a philosopher by the name of Jacques Derrida, he argued that religion is responsibility or it is nothing. In this context, evil is non-responsibility. That's what he says. What Jesus also offers here in this text is more questions than answers. Jesus is assigning us a significant task to work on by urging us to wrestle with further questions in our own context. Those questions can be like, what constitutes loving one another today? Who are the hungry? Who are the thirsty? Who are the strangers? Who are the naked? Who are the sick? Who are the imprisoned today? Not only in the city of LA or within the US territory, but also other parts of the world. Or like Augustine, what do I love when I love my God or when I love my Jesus? What does it mean to love God or love Jesus in our daily lives? Here, Jesus is very clear that loving one another is not a romantic act that does not want to see the dark sides, challenging and often disturbing side of love. Loving one another is a task, risk-taking act and taking an action for change the existing socio-political system in order to love the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned. According to the life and teachings of Jesus in the gospel, Jesus hardly mentioned about religion or church as an institutionalized entity. Jesus never shows any desire or a plan to found an institutionalized structure that we call now religion or church. Some of my students uh, were very disappointed because they thought that you know, Jesus is the founder of the church. Jesus did not intend to found anything but to announce the good news to the marginalized, to the poor, to the hungry, to the sick, to the imprisoned, to the exclusive, to the stranger, and to share his life with them and among them compassionately and responsibly. We must remind ourselves that church is the archive of this Jesus, and that the church is never about to have its own power and authority. The church defines and determines what Jesus stands for and what Jesus would do here and now. The primary duty of the church is therefore to bear the memory of Jesus 
and ask itself the question, what we must say and do in the importantly different situation between Jesus' time and time that we live now today. There are two kinds of churches, I think. One is uh, the responsible and mature church, and the other one is the irresponsible and immature churches. The responsible and mature church is a church that lives in this critical tension between the church as it is and the church as it ought to be. The church as it ought to be always remains as the church to come. In this sense, the church as it is always already the plan B, never a plan A. The church to come is the church as the site of the unconditional hospitality, the site of radical responsibility to the others, not only close others around you, but also distant others that you do not know. And the site of unconditional loving the, the other in our reality, where the marginalized, the excluded exist and suffer in various ways. The church to come dreams of a world where all singular persons in all places, countries, cultures, regions, and religion, and of all genders, races, classes, sexualities, abilities, enjoy the cosmic conviviality in the world that we confess that God creates and loves. Inheriting the tradition of the church is not merely for repetition of the tradition or justification of the doctrine and polity, but motivating people in the church and society toward the better practices of what Jesus asks us to do. People outside the church would not value would, would value doctrinal confession or a long-standing tradition not for the words or claim to truth and authority by the church itself, but for the ways in which the church and Jesusians in it enlarge the circle of inclusion of justice and equality for all singular persons in all places. What would happen if Jesus shows up in the uh, First Congregational Church next Sunday when you are about to celebrate 150 years anniversary? What would happen? Perhaps Jesus would remind us again and again that you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And every time you did practice radical hospitality for the least of my sisters and brothers, you did it for me. Let us Jesusians continue to dream an impossible dream for the church to come, where new practices of radical neighbor love radical inclusion, radical hospitality become actualized, which cross exclusive borders of citizenship, nationality, gender, class, sexuality, or ability, and regard all persons in all places as uniquely singular persons, each of whom has a proper name and unique face in the image of God. Amen.